All right. Uh, hello. Thanks, everybody. Uh, my name's David Malcolm. I work at Red Hat on GCC, and um, mostly my focus on GCC is on diagnostics, uh, errors and warnings, uh, the front end. And the last few years, I've been working on a static analysis, static analyzer for the inside of GCC, rather like um, the Clang static analyzer, I guess. And in this talk, I'm going to be talking about um, that GCC analyzer option and the work I've been doing running it um, or trying to run it on the Linux kernel to see what I can, um, what I, problems I can potentially detect statically. So these, this dash F analyzer option, I added it in GCC 10 um, and I made at least two major design errors in the way I'm tracking the state of memory inside the analyzer. So I would recommend don't use it until the, at least use GCC 11 is the minimum version you should use because I massively rewrote um, the insides for that and rewrote it more in GCC 12. And of course, there's more work coming on in, in along in, in trunk for GCC 13, which would be released in, I guess, the um, probably around April of next year. And more information on the analyzers on the GCC wiki and the, the, on the, uh, the URL I've got on this slide. And yeah, so. Dash F analyzer, it enables, oh, initially it was 15 warnings, which were mostly um, about uh, memory problems um, or our use after free uh, memory leaks and that kind of thing. And I've added more warnings in subsequent releases. And I think we're currently up to 42 warnings, um, amusingly, in, in chunk for GCC 13. I've had a couple of summer of code students I've been mentoring this summer um, have added, I think, nine warnings between them. And so how it works internally is um, similar uh, similar technically to the Clang static analyzer, as I understand it. It does symbolic execution, meaning we are effectively interpreting the user's code and we're um, ex sort of exploring paths interprocedurally through, um, through the code. Um, so we're sort of looking at both the control flow, gra control flow graph, the call graph, and also at each node we're tracking, each node in the analysis we're tracking sort of the state of memory and other program state, um, and potentially merging nodes to try and keep the analysis tractable. Uh, so I say we explore interesting for some definition of interesting, interesting paths through the code. So if you had, say, um, a, a memory state in which a pointer is pointing to the stack versus a memory state in which the, that pointer is pointing to the heap. Those are, in my heuristics, I feel are sufficiently interestingly different that let's, let's keep those, um, those branches of the analysis distinct um, rather than merging those. And so there are various, uh, and then basically it's kind of a brute force approach to um, exploring the program um, with, as I say, heuristics for merging. Um, and well, heuristics could be basically a euphemism for dirty hack. Um, and, um, and, and, and basically, we, we try and um, brute force our way through the code and, and try and focus the sort of the coverage of this analysis on as many, er and many paths as we can and as many sort of combinations of is this did this allocation succeed versus did it fail and things like that. Um, but there will be false positives and there can be false negatives for their various, um, um, for various reasons. So um, I, I call it a static analysis tool, which I think is fair, but it's, um, it's philosophically, it's kind of coming from the compiler warnings school of thought, which um, is a bit more, let's say a bit more loosey goosey compared to the formal program verification school of thought. We are, we are neither sound nor complete, if we're going to use the jargon. Um, we're sort of a bug finder rather than a ver verification tool. Um, and yeah, as I said, at, at each node in the analysis, uh, I've got a code to track the, or classes to track the state of memory, um, approximately, symbolically, and also the various API, uh, state machines uh, uh, associated with a node. Um, so we can track um, APIs uh, as, as uh, finite state machines. So we can do this pointer has been allocated and now it's been released. And so we can detect double freeze and we can detect uh, leaks that way. And, and, and that's a nice way of tracking various different APIs. 
And I've had lots of anecdotal reports of people saying, oh, I ran it on my code, it found some bugs, various bugs, and, and this is great. Um, and as a warning, I want people to sort of ideally run it as part of their workflow and find problem. Ideally, with a compiler warning, you would never, if you ran it on, say, GitHub, you would never see any results because the people would have already run and fixed the warning and you would never see it in the wild. It would be fixed on a developer's workstation before the patch is sent anywhere. Um, and so my, my, my goal is we never see analyze the results in the wild because it's all being fixed on people's workstations but obviously there's you know they because you want bugs fixed as early as possible um and so i'm hopefully the, the thing is doing its job um in the for people who are using it um and my goal is it's like a um it will double your compile time which is very rough um, there are many places where it's no longer the slowest optimization pass when I run it on, say, on the kernel, which um, which I guess is good. Um, I maybe we should make our optimization passes run faster. Um, yeah, but there are many limitations. As I said, there will be false positives. Um, so, you know, and there are bugs in my analysis code. And right now it's only really good for C code, but you guys and the kernel don't really use C++, so that's okay, I guess. As I say, don't use, don't use it, the GCCT, GCC 10 version, use uh, 11 onwards. Um, and so my my sort of day job has been, or much of my day job has been running, working on this static analyzer for C code in general. Um, but part of it has been showing it on the Linux kernel, which is I guess where you guys come in. And um, I've been building the sort of GCC trunk and then trying to build the upstream kernel um, with, um, well, I tried the rel kernel first, but now I've, I've switched to the uh, Linus's tree and um, I'm trying to build and basically um, digging my way through all the output it generated. Um, some of which were crashes in my analyzer, which are fixed, and um, lots of false positives. Um, and often these false positives sort of fell, to, fell into various groups. And there's a, a screenshot from a, the GCC tracker bug that I've got, and I fixed most of the false positives and all these problems I've seen. The one remaining, or the big remaining one, which is sort of the, the top one below the tracker bug, um, 10.62.18, which is um, the kernel's error.h. Um, you like to do error handling by, if you've got a function that returns a pointer, to pack s small negative integers into a pointer um, to signify various error codes. And my um, constraint tracking code, um, which is basically I try and figure out is this path, can this path really be executed? Uh, like if this F happens, then um, can this, and we follow that path, can later on, can this other if follow? And so because I'm not, my, because my constraint tracking isn't smart enough to cope with that yet, um, it will put, it will falsely think certain um, pairs of paths through a control flow graph are feasible when actually they're not. Um, so I hope to fix that, but that's not done yet. But many other issues I have fixed. Um, like some of them were sort of explosions where a source file, a particular kernel um, source file, would, I was sort of killing the analysis after half an hour because, yeah, that's clearly not, that's clearly something has gone horribly wrong. And I, I fixed all of those that I've seen. And so this sort of got um, beyond just building the existing, um, running the anal analyzer with the existing warnings. Um, and I, one of the other thing I did was just I've, I found running the run, running the analyzer on the kernel, I had to turn off a bunch of warnings um, that were spewing out noise. And I, I, I've got I think the slides for that are later on. But I was thinking, well, are there specific tests specific to the kernel? that um, that the analyzer could do. And I, I spoke about this at LPC virtually last year, and I'm interested in sort of statically analyzing the boundary between user space and kernel space, what you could call the, the attack surface of the kernel. And, um, and so you have um, info leaks where secrets or potentially uninitialized data is being copied back from kernel space to user space. 
and, and therefore that could be exposing information to an attacker. Or you have um, attack, uh, syscalls and other sources of, of data being copied from user space back into kernel space. And that attack, those attacker controlled values are not sufficiently sanitized before they get used and say uh, as an array index or whatnot. And in the static analysis world, we call that taint analysis. Um, and so in my analyzer, I, I have a, a taint, taint checking. And I guess you, you, in the kernel world, you, the kernel, you use the word taint to describe if a module, arbitrary module has been loaded. But so, but I, I mean, if for the purposes of this, taint means um, unsanitized attacker controlled data. And I've got an example, which is hopefully readable. Um, this is my, this is pro my prototype analyzer. Um, that's showing an info leak of um, uh, detecting an info leak where we have a, this is a historical one from 2011, um, where a particular buffer is made on the, uh, is um, copied to, um, is, is populated, um, uh, or it's showing line to, an, and the analyzer is showing um, events in the path. Now, there isn't actually any control flow in this example, uh, but it's showing event one, this, this region is, six byte region is created on the stack, and then it gets copied back to user space. It's not really showing initializations in the, in the path. Uh, but there's initial information saying that there's, um, I'm tracking uh, at the per bit level into procedurally what, um, what's been initialized. And, um, and, and here we, it, I'm detecting that one byte is uninitialized and I'm identifying to the developer that it's the padding after that particular field in the struct. Um, and so I identify which fields or which padding between fields is uninitialized and, and there's a fix hit hint that um, to um, force zero initialization of the thing to, to fix the, the problem. Um, although we also have mitigation now, thanks to uh, Ms. King, um, King Zhao, um, uh, who met, I don't know if she's in the room. Ah, one, thank you. Who, uh, you've met, you, you have the dash F trivial auto var in it uh, in GCC 12 that can mitigate these problems. But I mean, I, I feel that that's a mitigation option rather than a, a uh, like we, we want to initialize these explicitly, don't we, in code? You're nodding, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, that, yeah, thanks for that. It's a great feature. Um, and, it, and here's a taint example um, where um, we're copying, we're populating the, this, this command, command struct by copying it from user space. We're populating it. We do a little bit of sanitization. We show the control flow. Um, we're checking it against um, an upper bound. But unfortunately, it's a signed int. So at line 64, the, uh, we, 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 the, uh, my analyzer notes that it's an attacker controlled index and it hasn't been checked for negative, at which point we've got a right to kind of anywhere in memory, depending on what the attacker can provide. And what I just showed you is a prototype and I showed something similar last year. And I've tried, and the question is how do we, how does, how do we um, kind of communicate um, to the analyzer? What are the behaviors of these of, of these data types or functions? Um, what's the um, um, what, how, do, how uh, what can we support in the compiler that you can then express in the kernel source code to um, sort of express these concepts? And I went through many approaches. So the first approach I did was simply to um, this was year and a half ago to just special case if in the compiler if you see a function with a name copy from user or a function with a name copy to user then do this special thing and obviously it's a horrible hack and it I mean it's good for prototyping um but but it only works as well because if if it's a call to a copy from user that we don't have the body of, it hasn't been inlined. And that isn't at all the case in a real kernel tree because copy from user and copy to user are massively, there's a, one of the things I've learned trying to build, analyze the kernel is your, there's an awful, it's an awful lot of preprocessor and, um, and inlining and exactly what it, it, that turns into is um, quite complicated. Uh, I should say, actually, the GCC analyzer runs 
very late compared to a lot of static analysis tools um, because I run it basically at the point where LTO happens so that in theory to try and get um, to piggyback off that serialization so I can do link time analysis because we don't have a good story about serializing our internal representation but that's a whole other rant um, and so my second approach was well let's not hard code it can, I, can we add, add, add attributes that the kernel into the compiler that the kernel can use um, to uh, basically try and describe what is the behavior of these functions um, and I was even going as um, and I kind of want to express that this is a thing that can succeed or it can fail and on one outcome when it succeeds it um, return has this error code or so this return code and it does has these behaviors and I almost want a domain specific language for expressing this uh, but I this is and then I thought yeah you're over engineering this so that's my one of my pet um, um, bad habits I should say anyway, I demoed this at LPC last year's LPC and in I can't I think it was GCC 10 we added the access attribute um, and so you could say access read only um, like on copy to user where um, the second parameter the void um, we're saying we're reading from that and the amount we're guaranteeing the the, the attribute is basically providing the, the um, invariant that we read only up to n parameter three bytes from that buffer and the optimizer can make assumptions based on that and and I and we have read only or write only and I was thinking oh we can I can add untrusted read and untrusted write to convey that this is a this is doing that and I, I showed this last year's LPC and everyone said no don't do that um, you we have all this um, checker all these checker annotations the double underscore user uh, double underscore kernel to sort of indicate that this is a user or kernel pointer um, because um, and so I've been showing that um, uh, in, and I'll show you that in the subsequent slides but one thing I did get did get in that I, I showed at um, last year's LPC is um, and this is in GCC 12 is this attribute tainted args and the idea is you can put this on a function decal um, so for example, in the syscall define um, macro, which adds a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of, of attributes for a system call, you say, I'm basically saying this function, um, assume that the, the analyzer can assume that the arguments are attacker controlled, they need sanitization. And it looks at either direct arguments. So if you have an N, like um, if you're passing an int, um, that might be used as a as, as a limit or an array index. Well, don't trust it. Um, it you know, someone might be passing um, you know aggressively large values, or um, and sim and also any pointers that are passed. Assume that the, if you dereference it, it's um, that that data is untrust is um, untrustworthy. It needs sanitization. The other thing is that you can apply it to a, a field in a callback field in a struct. And anything that implements any function that is used to implement that callback field is has that sort same tainted args thing. So, I, for example, config fs store, I can mean that that size t um, thing is untrusted. And I, I um, I've been playing around with this. So, adding it to say syscall define, and like if I I've got a demo where um, this particular system call. Um, Autom because because I'm adding the attribute in one place in the kernel header, so, so suddenly all of the system calls get um, the analyzer knows the vert there that in that trust boundary that they're, they're attacker controlled, and I can detect that this copy to user of n bytes. Well, that n bytes was parameter. What is it? One, two, th parameter three of this thing, and it's and it hadn't been sanitized at this point. At which point you're copying to user and the and the, the attacker can say, oh, give me, give me, give me all the bytes. Um, and, um, and an example of using this could be um, with a suitable macro in um, compiler types.h is to say, um, mark the ioctal callbacks um, in the file operations so that all ioctals get flagged to the analyzer as being um, 
a, a, a worthy of worthy of inspection, which I think because uh, IOCTL tends to be the place where things. So I guess the a question is, any ideas on? Um, hopefully, you, you people have ideas on where this should go. Maybe a comment from a chat. Ben mm. Black mentions these trust boundaries might not even be only between kernel and user space, but also between hardware and kernel as well. Mm. Yes, yeah, very much so. Like if you have a USB device, a hostile USB device might, um, maybe if I'm understanding things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. No. Oh, sorry. Yes, I guess maybe network input could also be interesting. Um, network input, yeah. Like if you... so I think there's a paper called Periscope or something. So I think they explored like other attack vectors, how you can inject uh, mm -hmm. any user control data into the kernel. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe they have also some pointers on, on where you can inject those. You say it was called telescope? Uh, Periscope. Per with P. Periscope, as in submarines. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And there's a question back there or comment and actually making so, so you're now looking onto into just user space to, okay. uh, sorry you're now looking into just user space and kernel separation but what we started to look also recently with this introduction of confidential cloud computing is that all your low level inputs which you can get if you're running inside a vm mm -hmm. the low level inputs which you can get by reading an msr or doing an mio port io read and stuff they're also untrusted so, for example, what we did in smart analysis uh, analyzer is that we are now tagging not just the user data. It's okay, user data is one kind of attack surface, but we're also tagging what can potentially come through the whole, what we call host data or VMM and trusted data. So it's a whole another angle where you can have an attack surface. So. Yeah, and it sounds it sounds like there needs to be some sort of annotation for. Um, um, one of the ideas is: Do we have, like, for example, an intrinsic? Should we have an intrinsic that basically says this is one of these boundaries, like that potentially you could put in a built-in, mm -hmm. um, make this tainted? Um, I, I almost think of um, like in terms of like sources and sinks. Like yeah. if you, we need some way of annotating or attributing that a source of data is tainted mm -hmm. and another way of attributing potentially um, interesting functions perhaps that are sinks. And so if we can see any form of data flow from the sink to the source, maybe we can produce a diagnostic or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's important to separate with different sources because, you know, in, in one threat model, I might be concerned about the user space inputs, the map threat model which I'm protecting to, but maybe in the other model, I'm not so concerned about this ones, but I only want to protect against, let's say, malicious host inputs, or maybe I want to protect against both. So this has to be, they have to be decoupled. So it's not just one attribute, like, you know, tainted because we're tainted against what? This is what my point is. So because the, it, it, your threat model, can change and, and, and you're not going to be okay with just one attribute anymore. Or address space. I don't know. Nice. Yeah, well, I can um, I talk about address spaces actually in the following slides. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that approach didn't fly, but, but I got, but one of the things I posted was that, yeah, trusted, uh, um, was it tainted args thing. And the next, I posted a patch, patches to last November to the GCC, GCC list and to um, I think the Linux tool chains list I cross posted it um, and I, with two different approaches for marking these boundaries and the, the first of those was um, a hash pragma GCC custom address space so C has a concept um, of um, I think there's uh, I can't remember which standard uh, or extension to see it is, but there's a concept of a custom address space where rather than having, and it works kind of like a qualifier, like const or volatile, you basically are defining new types of um, the, where this lives and you have a generic address space, but you can have other address spaces and they they form sort of, you could do a, a think of it as a forest or a Venn diagram, that what is inside what, and some, some have a, is contained by relationship and some are entirely independent and the idea being that um, you can have um, like a lot of our back ends um, we uh, there'd be like a, a flash memory um, so you can say that this isn't just a void star it's a flash memory void star um, and so uh, I tried 
um, and, and right now GCC's implementation is it's all target specific and uh, I was going to say it's an enum unfortunately it's a set of hash defines um, but the um, and I, I posted a patch and unfortunately my patch kind of was a bit of a work in progress and it didn't well I say work it didn't work um, and there was a bit of pushback from the back end people rightly so because um, I think I would have broken a bunch of the back ends um, but it seems an interesting approach that we could say that um, un, double, uh, double underscore user a double underscore kernel are different address spaces and um, how um, uh, sparse the sparse checker implements that, or at least how the com compiler was it compiler types header in the kernels. Ha if if checker is enabled, um, it has an attribute address space um, and then an index. Um, whereas the the C uh, the C standard for address spaces they act like a reserved words. Uh, they begin with a double underscore so you'd have a double underscore flash void star um, and so this pragma basically define adds a new reserved word when you use it um, you, you, it's, and it's like pragma gcc a custom address space i don't know address space u, as underscore user for address space user and or uh, or if you do double underscore user and it would give you a you can then use double underscore user as a reserved word um, and apart from the fact that apart from the fact my implementation didn't work that's one problem and there's another problem that i'll come to on a, another slide the next thing i tried was adding an attribute untrusted again as a kind of a qualifier for types um and, and it kind of works but i ran into issues where um is a untrusted foo an attribute foo star versus a foo attribute star what does the attribute apply to? Uh, does it apply to the foo or does it apply to the foo star? And um, and I'm not entirely sure, but it seems that Sparse is treating that differently to what GCC is doing. And though, I mean, this is also, I was wading through, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of pre-processed code in a code base that I don't fully understand uh, with other things to work on. So, um, I and I believe, Jose, you ran into a similar issue with this within your work. Do you want to speak on? Yeah, um, because of something that is going to be used in BPF or intended to, to be used in BPF, um, I think the BPF people, they want to also reuse the ex some existing sparse annotations in the kernel sources precisely i think it is the one with the address space um, and when we made the implementation in gcc we found exactly the same problem mm -hmm. which is that in certain cases particularly when there are const and stars and uh, you know pointers to pointers to pointers to pointers um, the sparse annotations they use a different ordering so they apply to different entities than the standard compiler attributes and this makes it difficult to reuse sparse annotations as compiler built-ins uh, sorry built-ins attributes <laughs> we have to be careful here uh, with the nomenclature yeah. so we have the same problem yes and it's not clear how to how to fix this yeah because if we say okay well if it's not a user foo star you need to write foo, or you don't you could you shouldn't be writing foo user star you should be writing user foo star or i'm not quite sure what but that's going to change like hundreds of thousands of lines in the kernel and i don't think that's going to fly well yeah and also um they will not be legal sparse annotations anymore right or they will not be placed up properly anymore and I, I, do we have any sparse maintainers in the room or on the chat uh, <laughs> no okay um so that that is another issue um and so i'm not quite sure in that there's some sort of the exact syntax seems to be there's some there's some friction there um and approach number five um a few months ago i came out i had an aha moment and figured out a better way of implementing my custom address space idea and i have an implementation that actually works and is potentially acceptable to the gcc backend people which haven't yet posted and i managed to successfully build the kernel with this 
and build and boot the kernel with this, which is woohoo, I hadn't gotten that far before. But um, the next problem I ran into was, um, oh well, yeah, and the, the way I'm doing that is um, yeah, adding Pragma custom address space AS user and then adding that, um, it becomes a reserved word to double underscore user and to, and similarly for IOMEM. And I tried it for RCU and I can't remember the other one. Um, and ran into issues there, yeah, oh yeah, the per CPU. And the issue I had with the per CPU is, is, is here where um, you've got a current task is a per CPU, um, I don't know, it's doing a type of, and in get current, it's doing a get type of current task. And so it's trying to create a local variable, and that local variable is a per CPU variable, and GCC, the, GCC front end is saying, well, you're trying to create a local variable of per CPU type, and I don't know what it, that, or at least you're trying to create a local variable in a um, custom address space, and it doesn't know that per CPU means um, per CPU, it's a custom, uh, and so it buffs, um, and so I just didn't do it for that, for per CPU. And similarly with RCU, I, I, and I'm looking, and yeah, struct RB node star as a, and I was looking at it thinking, yeah, I will go and look at something else because uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm being, I, I, you know, I, the, I spent some months wading through error messages. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that the, the RCU tag is only defined uh, in sparse runs. Well, that's the point. I'm defining it. I'm, oh, I, okay. I'm providing my own definition. I'm okay. catching the headers to use it and then running into problems and deciding, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Okay. <laughs> so that's the purpose of this slide. Um, uh, right. But that actually, bring, that actually brings up a really, a point that I, um, I sort of, I think I get to one of the later slides, which is I, I want to use these annotations in order to try, for my analyzer, to try and identify the, the boundary between user space and kernel space. And, but do I treat these as different types? Um, and if so, should I be enforcing, should I be, should the C, I'm, part of my patch is to the C front end to, to sort of accumulate these, they work like qualifiers, a new type of qualifier like const or volatile or um, atomic. But um, are these different types? Do I enforce it's an, it's an error message? You know, is a hard error when you have a bad cast between them because they're different. Here's, yeah, on this slide, it's a disjoint address space. If I you remember, I said there was this sort of Venn diagram of, wit, um, uh, yeah, and, uh, you've got a hand up. It's interesting that this uh, example and the one before is both in ASM offsets, uh, which is not actually kernel code. Uh, it's it's a, a, a something we generate just runs at the host to to create a file with uh, preprocessor symbols with different offsets. Okay. And I imagine, well, it's basically host code, not kernel code. So if all your examples are in ASM offsets, it might be uh, a symptom of something other than your approach being uh, unsound. It may be because this is code that gets built first in the in the build process. And I'm, you know, and, it, and these are hard errors, so I, my build couldn't progress any further. And in order to try and get the kernel building, it's like, oh, I'll turn that off because my primary interest is the user kernel boundary. And it's like, well, I could try this. Oh, it's not working. It's killing, it's breaking the build and turn it off, which is, you know, it's a prototype kind of, you know, I'm a prototyping. Um, where did we get to? Oh yeah, the, the next issue, yeah, the issue I ran into with this is the double underscore force, but which is um, the sparse checkers way of saying, just ignore this difference and force a cast between these two. Um, where, yeah, you've got this double underscore force, which after pre-processing, well, how do I implement that if I'm going to check these, if I'm going to have this as, these as different types that the C front end is going to type check? Um, and I tried implementing a new attribute, uh, attribute allow address space cast, and I got it kind of working, but I ran into the same issues with 
where it didn't work all the time and it was kind of, I, th I think it was another symptom of the, is it a user foo star versus a foo user star or is it a foo star user star and thing, all kinds of, all those horrible, you know, where does the, you were talking about, was it West const versus East const? And yeah, I was going to ask David, do you think it might, it might be worthwhile for kernel developers to consider potentially moving around or cleaning up some of these annotations? Like, it seems to me like if we followed the similar rules yeah. to qualifiers in C for user, like we might be able to disambiguate some of these. Yeah, they, Sparse implements it as an attribute, these things as an attribute, or at least it implements u double underscore user as an attribute. Um, and I can't remember how it implements double underscore force, whether it's just, it, whether it, is an actual keyword in um, in sparse. I'm not sure. So this is another issue I ran into. And so what I did in order to get this, I got this approach to build and boot a kernel, but I just hacked out the type checking part of it from the, my patch uh, to the C front end. And you have your hand up. Um, another possibility which might work at least for at least one of these problems and maybe another one with a bit of extra work, you could declare them to be set things with different address spaces to be different types, but they're all the same and compatible with each other. Yeah, um, so but I don't know whether that would work for the th for things cases where they're being passed to functions because it, uh, because they're still dis distinct pointer type distinct pointer types. You may need to carve a similar exception out for pointer types. Um, for, that sort of thing, which is conceptually similar to assignment, sort of. Yeah, I mean, from an implementation point of view, the um, my my this implementation of customer address spaces that I got that worked, from a back end point of view, um, everything looks like the generic address space. Um, they're all um, whereas um, the other normally the back end address the ta the target specific address spaces are not necessarily don't even necessarily have the same number of bits as the regular generic address space and the target can inject um rtl you know can inject instructions for reads and writes and it's like how do i actually read this thing how do i write to this thing um whereas this is basically it's a it's like a void star or it's like a t star or whatever um um and i just, it, uh, the and the distinction only in this patch set only exists um from uh, the point of view of the front end and from the point of view of the analyzer and I kind of um, have it nicely hidden away from the, the target stuff. And so this brings the, the, where, I, where I am, or where I got to last week, five minutes, um, was um, I had this aha moment where I was thinking there's a chicken and egg problem here, which is GCC has an annual release cycle. Now, every year we put out a new release in like April. And how do we provide stuff that's useful to you um, and how do, I guess it's useful for, you know, <laughs> to, for GCC developers and toolchain developers to attend this conference. Yay, we have a track. Um, but um, where we can't just throw stuff over the wall every year um, and have and say, here, here's a new feature. Um, go play with this. And then you come back, you try it and find, yeah, I tried it and it kind of kind of worked, but also didn't. And then in, in GCC N plus one, can you make it work a slightly different way? And then we say, well, do we have to maintain compatibility with the original version of it? And is anyone using it? And if you were the, we're doing it, if we added this feature for you guys. Um, so I, I, as an example of, this felt, feels like an example of this, where I want something that we can support from the GCC side that will be useful to you guys and you can run with them. What I've been of, um, and, and so how to do that. And what I had been avoiding was using a GCC plugin because, um, sorry, but well, our plugin interface kind of sucks. Uh, I probably should, I don't know, it, it, it's not ideal. Um, and, but by adding a, but by, I had like the, the info leak and taint stuff was like a 2000, 2000 line patch in terms of the implementation plus a lot of test cases and I was I figured out well what I can do is I can move much of it into GCC's source tree and I got it down to just a 240 line plugin and the idea is can I make that plugin smaller so I think last week I I added a new plugin hook where for known functions so I can a plugin can register this is the behavior of this function, which is basically re-implementing that initial hack idea. 
um, but it means I can also then implement that plugin in my test suite and have a small, relatively small plugin that just calls into a whole bunch of functionality that's in the core GCC. You've got your hand up. Um, yeah, speaking from the, the kernel perspective on uh, GCC plugins, uh, we're mostly trying to deprecate our use of it mm -hmm. um, since we're, I don't know, people are actually now doing stuff in core GCC and Clang for a lot of the things that the kernel uh, wants. So uh, currently we're trying to say we're not adding new ones mm -hmm. um, and, and this has actually helped get a bunch of stuff uh, into the, the core uh, compilers uh, in both places. Um, but uh, I don't know, as, as an experimental way to try out new things, yeah. sure, it's fine, but I mean, I don't, I don't think it'll be landing up, up yeah. there. But. As far as I understand, these options are for developers. So F analyze will not be enabled in production kernel builds of the distributions. <laughs> yeah, no. uh, since production distributions will not use that option, you can break it between minor point releases of GCC. It doesn't That's matter. A good point. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, and so the idea is let the developers suffer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the idea being, well, it's two hundred forty lines. Can I? And suddenly, having done that last week, I was, oh, I can actually make it smaller. And I can make it smaller this way, and at least, you know, uh, the, the 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 badness of having a GCC plugin. Well, at least it's a smaller plugin than it might have been, um, and and so and I running yeah running the analyzer. Um, I found some interesting issues like um, one of my warnings is a write to const, and it fired here, and it turns out it looks like this is a specific test code to to, to see what happens if we write to const, and happily the analyzer found that, and I have to. I have to um, allow list it with this, it, it, do an ignore of it. So that, that was a yay moment um, that, it, that the analyzer found that. Uh, but also but another one it found was in this driver where in the startup code, it's doing, yeah, it, it, one more minute. Yeah, it's, do, it's, it, it's writing to this um, array that it is const and it's happening in a startup function. Is that legitimate? I don't know. I mean, because you're the kernel, you control the read write flags on the pages um, so maybe it's valid I, I i don't know so um so that's one it i ran into um and um, i'm not sure so yeah we've kind of I said, we're kind of running out of time run out of time but we've had a fair bit of discussion i hope already and like do quite should gcc try and type check the user versus kernel or should we leave it to sparse and part of me thinks well if the if if my type checking is sort of disagreeing, well, maybe the type annotations are wrong, and uh, it would be good to know that the what how my what I'm seeing of the of markup is wrong, or I, I don't know is because it, it's sort of the markup the type check that type user versus kernel is sort of a, in some ways is a solved problem, um, and I really wish there was a sparse developer in the um, in the in the audience. Um, and also, which approach would would a I mean, custom address spaces as reserved words, or as attributes, or um, or do I, a different kind of attribute like attribute untrusted? I'm not quite sure which way to go, but I guess the good thing about having a plugin is we can experiment. Yeah, it, Paul, you have your hand up. So the. Uh... Intent for some of them, I'll speak mostly for under our RCU. The, the whole point of it is to restrict what types of uh, variables can be passed to what functions. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we were doing C, you could use type management tricks to make that work and make it work nicely and everything would be happy. Uh, the, the problem is that with RCU in particular, and maybe this is a problem with the user as well, for all I know, is that uh, we've we we provided this as a facility that maintainers can choose to use. And maintainers that choose not to use it filter out the sparse complaints, and that's their right. Uh, one issue with, with RCU adding it in this way to GCC would be that they'd have to change their filtering or they'd get surprised or something. And uh, for all I know, you may have a similar thing with user. If there's somebody here who um, doesn't do the user marking and ignores the sparse warnings, it'd be a good time to to let this gentleman know. 
And I think we're out of time, unfortunately. So I guess my, my other thing is ideas for other kernel specific tests, but I guess S smash, smash exists already, so which is doing a lot of similar things. But anyway, um, hopefully this was um, entertaining and useful. Thanks.